We move on to our first research presentation. And this is a United Board funded project in 2008 on the Plateau Culture Initiatives. I would like to call on Mr. Gerald Roche to give us the presentation. My name is Lip Lucky. That's right. <laughs> People usually call me that actually. Actually, it's actually. Um, I'm from uh, southwest of Sichuan in China. I'm now working with the. Uh, <laughs> I'm working with uh, my colleague here, Gerald Roach, who was also used to be my English teacher. So now I'm uh, working as a UNESCO consultant in Qinghai province in China. And uh, I'm a uh, Tibetan. Um, officially, I'm not class classified as a Tibetan, but uh, our custom, language, and they are really distinct distinctive from the mainstream of Tibetans, like in terms of languages, customs, and clothing, like that. And the language, the population of speaking the language is uh, 5,000 only, so we're a small group from. I think that's all. Okay, and uh, I'm the second presenter, Gerald Roach. I'm an English teacher at Qinghai Normal University in China, and uh, also involved in some cultural projects, collaborating with people like Li Bulaki. So, we're talking about a case study of collaborative cultural documentation and its impact. So, the, the case studies that we're going to talk about is uh, two pieces of writing that were produced by Li Bulaki and various collaborators. So one of them is a small book on uh, folk musical traditions, particularly on the genre of music called uh, Madami. And the second one we're going to be talking about is a piece of writing, an academic article here, which is about a ritual performed in Namji communities which calls back the soul of a person who has, a, their soul has escaped from their body and they've become ill, basically. So those are the case studies, and we'll begin by just looking at what do I mean by collaborative? Uh, okay, so this is just a definition of what I mean by collaborative cultural documentation. Um, First of all, it's an approach to cultural documentation that takes advantage of the differing capacities of two or more people to produce a document that none of them could produce alone. So it just means that you know, a group or two or more people work together uh, to help each other do something that none of them could do simply by themselves. So for example, with the, this work, the materials, the music was collected by Lee Bulaki. The musical transcription that is in the book was done by a Chinese ethnomusicologist. And then there was another um, English teacher, Dr. Kevin Stewart, who was working with Li Bulaki to develop the text. And then I contributed to that work by doing a sort of a lyrical and poetic analysis of it. So that's the, the sort of a collaborative part. Um, this sort of work is also mutually empowering. That means it empowers everyone involved in the project in some ways. Uh, whether that's through increased capacity or, or a capital, like academic capital, such as having a paper published in an international journal. But um, in addition to being mutually empowering for all the authors, it specifically attempts to provide opportunities for disempowered voices to be heard in powerful discourses. So that might mean uh, linguistic or ethnic minorities uh, being heard in international forums where they usually wouldn't have a chance to be heard. And then uh, finally, this kind of approach gives primacy to local knowledge over its analysis and interpretation through theoretical or comparative frameworks. So I guess that speaks for itself. So the next, I'll just give a brief outline of what we're going to do. First, Lee Bilaki is going to talk about the process of documentation behind the two projects I mentioned. Then we'll both talk about the process of collaborative writing. I'll talk briefly about how these materials and materials like them are being used in the 
uh, classrooms. And then Lee Balaki will finish by talking about what's the, what's the impact of this kind of work on himself as the collaborator, as an individual. And then finally, what's the impact on the community where he's from and where these materials were collected. Okay. For the documentation, I think it's a start by me as a local person from a local cultural context. <laughs> And uh, to this, I think first, when I was start doing that, I was a university student. I think that process in everybody. You know, as a student, uh, you really like hang around. You know, you don't <laughs> after sc finish school, so you just like you don't really have the awareness or yeah, the sense of uh, the importance of your local culture, like the customs, the cultures you have. I, I didn't really have that kind of things at the beginning as a uh, university student at the time. Then like under my English teachers, like Yerdo Roach and another uh, English teacher, they encouraged me and like provide the recorders. Then by that time I went home with the recorders and with my, with my uh, relatives and recorded those songs. So it's not, it's not, like, it's not like I planned it. You know, it's like, like, it's not like a movie or film director. You know, I have the ideas, I'm going to record it, this, and I'm going to ar ar archive it online. It's not like that. So it's like, uh, kind of like, um, you know, awareness. I don't have, I didn't have awareness and have the chance, have the uh, recorders, then I went home. And I have the advantage. What's the advantage? Ad advantage is like, uh, we, ha we, had a, we have a custom, like, when the relatives and brothers, sisters, we meet, each, we meet each other after a certain process of departure each other. Like, we didn't see each other for a long time, now today uh, we meet each other. So for example, I return from school, from Qinghai, which is very far from Sichuan, so it's a really different province. So I return home, then automatically, my relatives gathered, came to my home, and we sing a song called Madami, uh, the mission. So, so, oh yeah, actually I have an example of this. Yeah, you can hear the thing. This is uh, one example. So uh, we put that into this, in this book already. So we have the music note and the con contextualization, like the explanation. So we put that in, in here. So the, the advantage, advantage I have here is like, I am a local person, you know, the represent, representative of the local, local people, local community. And I have the adva advantage of uh, gathering the data to record, like, Otherwise, I think like from uh, another person from outside, I think at least it's challenging. I think so. You know, you, you are um, accepted it, accepted in the in the text, but I, I'm the local person and accepted, and uh, people are comfortable singing like yes, you, you you heard. So I think I have that advantage, and that's how I uh, got the. That's my field of work. I think that's the beginning process of the book. You. Is. And then, also, again, I didn't have the plan, like, 
I have the materials, I have the sound data, as you heard. And I return to school, and I have school assignment in the school. And then, the, you know, it's, it is a process. Like, it's a process, an educa education process for me, and realization. You know, I, I heard that, like, when I was outside of my hometown, sometimes natural, I have homesick. I think that is also many people have that, I guess, it's naturally. So because uh, this, the place uh, where I study is like culturally, it's, uh, there's differences. So I'm big and I listen to music and I realize it's some things, it has some power make you comfortable like when you're homesick, for example. And then I realized the value or you know, the value of the culture and the importance. So then I have the desire I should not say desire, or I have the really wish to you know, protect it. I am the uh, local person, so I want to at least make it safe. So they came up with the idea of you know, put, putting it together into the book. And, yeah. So, yeah, so like, it's not a plan, that's my idea. So I didn't even plan that. I, it's, I went through a process of realization by doing this. So, then when we begin the writing process, it, it's never initiated by someone like me or one of the other teachers sitting down with the students and saying, listen, you have to do this. This is something I'm going to force you to do. It always begins with something like what Nibelaki was just describing, where a student comes to realize the value of some part of their culture that they hadn't reflected on before. And then they can come to me or one of the other teachers and say, I think this is important and I want to do something to document it. So then the next step from there in the writing process is that I would sit down with them and uh, discuss what they wanted to write about, try to make a plan for how we would structure a paper or a book or whatever, and also discuss with them just in order to develop sufficient detail in their description that it would make sense to someone who is not from that local context, who's not from that village, doesn't speak that language, and so on. So once we got past the stage of uh, developing detail, contextualization, structuring the paper, then we sit down, uh, Livalaki would be spending a couple of hours each day writing, then I would be checking it, and we'd be going through a process of editing, and then sometimes it's necessary to bring in other people to uh, do something that would make the paper more accessible to a wider audience. So, for example, with the paper that Libulaki wrote on soul calling, um, I did a literature review which was on uh, the sort of the distribution of these traditions of soul calling and soul loss traditions uh, throughout Southeast Asia, throughout China, throughout the Tibetan Plateau and surrounding regions. And so when you put it in that kind of uh, context, it makes it more accessible to academics and the wider audience. Um, oh yeah, so the website here, these are all of Libudlaki's writing is available online, so you can take a look. So that's basically the writing process. After the documentation has been done by the student, they've reflected on it, they've decided they want to write about something, that's the process we go through. So next I'll talk about the classroom. Um, I should introduce the context of the classroom I'm talking about, which is a program at Qinghai, a normal university, called the English Training Program. And um, in that program, all these students are from remote, impoverished, mostly minority communities. Most of the students in our program are Tibetan, but they also come from other backgrounds. And the aim of the program is to provide uh, high quality English language instruction to those students because there's a belief that uh, English language instruction can be empowering for people of, from those backgrounds. Uh, for example, it increases their employment opportunities, it gives them access to educational opportunities that they wouldn't have had before, it gives them access to information they wouldn't have had, and it also enables them to do things like uh, run small scale community development programs and bring you know, real material benefits to their community. So we encourage English learning as a form of uh, empowerment for those students and for those communities as well. So then when we're 
uh, teaching English in that context, we try to use these materials like the one that Liwalaki has written or a wide range of other materials with our students because it provides a culturally familiar context for them to uh, deal with high level language uh, learning tasks. So it just means that when they're reading, for example, about someone who has uh, lost their soul and is undergoing a ritual uh, to call their soul back that's being conducted with by their mother, that's a familiar situation for them. Many of the students have been in that kind of situation. They don't have to try and uh, imagine too deeply what's going on. On the other hand, if you give them a sort of standard English learning text where it's talking about scuba diving, going for pizza and roller skating and talking about the recent elections and so on, that's really weird and that's a really unusual bunch of information for them to deal with. So if you have culturally familiar context, it means you can concentrate more on the language side of the learning process rather than trying to process both at once. So that's one benefit of these materials in the classroom. Um, another benefit of these kind of materials is that then it enables in a classroom situation for students to reflect on their own local culture and for, to discuss with other students and learn about the local cultural variety. So just to give an example, um, if we can use language as a measure of diversity in the Tibetan context, the, there's been a study showing that there's something like 26 different separate Tibetan languages spoken at the moment on the plateau. Uh, in addition to that, there's about 49 dialects and this is not counting the several other, perhaps a dozen languages like Libelaki's language, which are spoken by people who are classified as Tibetan. So there's an enormous amount of cultural diversity, which is very rarely discussed, even among Tibetans themselves. And so teaching with these kinds of materials gives students an opportunity to uh, talk about these kinds of issues and uh, get a sense of um, of themselves as a, as, as a specifically localized sort of uh, Tibetan. Um, why this is important is because for, for some students, if you ask what religion do you follow in your village, they will say something like blind faith or superstition or the Chinese term bad, which translates as a bad religion. Because if they think if their religion is not one of the canonical sort of uh, Islam, Christianity, or Buddhism, then whatever they're doing must somehow be not a religion or an inferior sort of religion. So these materials also give uh, students who are learning from them a different sense of identity, a different sense of pride in, in who they are. Um, another example of one of the activities we did was with the, the paper on soul calling rituals. We discussed that paper in class, and then I showed the students the video that Libulaki had made of uh, his mother performing this ritual. And then we talked about the differences between the video and the paper, and then that was able to turn into a critical, reflexive exercise about how a text is constructed, and what are the constraints, and what are the criteria that we should use to judge a text. So. Um, in addition to the language learning objectives and the sense of identity, there are also uh, these sort of higher order thinking um, tasks that can be done with these texts. So then, that's that's how we use these materials in the classroom, and that's some of the impacts. Next, Libu Laki will talk about the, the impact of this kind of work on, on him as an individual and on his community. So, again, as a collaborator, I think as a, by doing this, it really empowered me in two ways. First, after done, I've done all this work, like published several papers and book, books, then of course I have more experiences and I have more confidence to continue more works like this, like to write more papers and books. I think that's one uh, very significant, that's really significant feeling I had after doing this. Uh, secondly, as a collaborator, I also um, feel really, my idea, the, as, as I mentioned, the uh, idealize, uh, the realization, again, you, you realize the importance of your own customs, culture. Yeah, I think that's also important. And, and as, as the 
zero the root patient. People usually, I, I also like before, like, like we have native, we have local mountain deities that we believe in, and which which, which cannot really belong to like Buddhism or some other big religions in the world. So before I had like all this like superstitions or you know things like that, but by doing this this kind of work, you know, you, you realize that it is not at least it is not superstitious. So and it has values, it has powers, just like the song, make you feel happy when you fall sick. And like the religions that the mountain deities you believe in, it has powers too when people get sick. So that like when, when people get sick in my hometown, like we, we invite religious specialists to China. So that that's has power. That what make people like you know that's the, that's the life. That's the cultures. And as a as a collaborator, by doing this, really I have realized that I think that's made a really different in my perspectives. And also, and thirdly, it's uh, also to the community like. My, my relatives and the villagers that surround me, around me in the, the village, they see me going to school, doing, usually, they, what they see is go to school and graduate, uh, graduated from school with a diploma and find a job. That's the idea of China, I think. I think. <laughs> but what, what I'm doing here different, a little bit differently is, yes, I'm going to school, I, I graduated from school with a diploma and, but, Doing something a little bit different, like have interest in my own culture, do a little bit of research, and trying to uh, preserve preserve the culture that I'm endowed, you know, that with my birth. I think so. And by doing this, like book, write book and papers. So by after doing this, I, I, I gained experiences, of course. So and the last, like, for example, last summer I I had that. Uh, Grant from private donors, and I organized a party in my village. Which, which it, the basic goal is, is to, you know, encourage people to practice their own cultures in the original uh, context. So, like in summer, we have uh, festivals, but the festival is now almost gone because, as you know, like mobile phones, televisions, especially the young people, they are only interested in modern production. You know those things like computers. So not so many people are interested in those kind of festivals. Then, but but now I really kind of reorganize and re uh, encourage people to go back into the context and practice the original uh, cultures. I think like singing. So that 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 project organizes like I encourage people to sing and tell tell stories. And I got the funds like to reward like who's the first, who's the singer, second. Like that, so and of course uh, the villagers, people see this. They really wish, especially the elders, elder, elder people. They wish me to continue this kind of project. You know, create, a, encourage them, like reward a little bit financial things. You know, a little bit money to them, and then that will encourage new generation, especially the old people, come up to me and decide. So, look, people like basically my relatives because I know everybody basically in the village. So. They really like it, and and I'm a proud of doing it. <laughs> um, so just by way of conclusion, I've just we've got a list of references, which is about this this kind of collaborative cultural documentation work. So um, I wrote a paper with some of my collaborators uh, about this kind of work. Um, I have a PDF if anyone wants a copy. But there's also this is an early collaborative cultural documentation project from Sabah. The paper is available free online as well. There's a book on collaborative ethnography. And uh, last of all, this is where we're publishing all our materials. We have about eight volumes of um, the papers and monographs which are available all here for download. We're working currently on about 10 more volumes of material that will be published during this year. And uh, I would really appreciate it if any of you took a look at it and maybe you found it useful in your classrooms. I'd uh, be very happy to hear from anyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
and Mr. Jerome Roche. Now we are opening the table, or the floor for a short open forum. Yes, sir. I am uh, Raydan Lakson from Notre Dame University in Catabato City. That's uh, the southern part of the Philippines and uh, interestingly, the center of uh, conflict as well. Uh, between the, and among the different cultures and religions in Mindanao. Uh, I find your presentation very interesting in as much as it talks about collaborative research and uh, to uh, be good and lucky for having been engaged in that collaboration, a reawakening of uh, cultural identity and interest into it. Uh, I have a problem though in my uh, locality because we are in a conflict setting. And uh, in many, many instances, I've been engaged in collaborative research of some sort. I'm a Christian and uh, a descendant of the settler in Mindanao, and Mindanao's conflict between uh, the government and the uh, moral Muslims are actually land based. At one time, we uh, documented not tender stories in central Mindanao that brought us really right smack into the middle of the issues, uh, including our own psychological, historical, and uh, biological links. Uh, my colleagues who were uh, Muslims. And uh, uh, together with me and my Christian colleagues as well, I begin to notice in our collaboration we were actually also contesting each other. Uh, we, we we documented it from the, the stories, from our uh, our biases as well, with the end in mind that actually the result would indict would indict the other party upon the accusation that we are trying to build. So. Well, uh, I don't know what will happen to that, but I believe it's a book if you can access that. Uh, LGSPA, Land Tenure Stories in Central Mindanao, that's online as well. Uh, it's really a, a, a good, a good uh, material for reflection among researchers. Now my question is, that how is, the, how is the, this leading to a, some, some sort of theoretical uh, entity later on because I am really looking at some theoretical framework to explain and uh, to enroll our engagement as well, collaboration under fire some sort, when the topic is uh, highly conflictual and where the actors and researchers are also contesting each other. Basically my short answer to that question about whether it's leading to any sort of theoretical output would be no where the, the aim of what we're really trying to do is uh, document the diversity of local knowledge in a specific region in a way that we see is ethically sound and uh, so for example it is empowering for disempowered people but in terms of whether we want it to result in a theoretical outcome that's not really our, our goal. I think all the people involved in the, the work that we're doing are certainly learning things about the collaborative process, uh, about uh, you know, ethical questions of cultural documentation, about issues of cultural diversity, and so on. So I, I imagine that in the long term we will produce more and more conclusions of a theoretical nature that will be useful for people, I hope, but that's really not what we're trying to, to do. So. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's free. It's online. You can. Uh, thank you. Uh, is there any other questions, comments, or reactions? No, no more. No more questions. So, yeah, that note, maybe we can uh, now thank again, once again, uh, Dr. Murai and Mr. Murai and Mr. Murai for sharing with us their study on collaborative cultural documentation and